50 times a night to make sure that it was turned off. That's just one example of obsessive compulsive behavior. We'll find out more about this bizarre disorder next on Sonia Live. Hello and welcome to the second hour of our show. Being a little obsessive about cleaning the house or making sure that the house is locked, well, that's probably pretty normal. But do you check your locks for hours? Do you wash your hands until they're raw? Do you perform rituals before going through a door? These are symptoms of a brain disorder. It's called obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. Over four million people suffer from this ritualistic repetitive behavior in the United States. Dr. Judith Rappaport joins us. She began studying OCD in 1972. She's chief of the child psychiatric branch at the National Institute of Mental Health. Her fascinating look at patients with OCD is called The Boy Who Couldn't Stop Washing. Steve Strasser is a psychologist. He had a full-blown attack of OCD when he was 22 years old. Welcome to both of you. Steve, what does that mean, you had a full-blown attack of OCD? What does it feel like having an obsessive-compulsive disorder? Well, the feeling is undescribable. It's so painful, and, and, and the pain never ends. Uh, a full-blown attack is that the disease manifests itself can come across in many different ways in different people. In some people, it's compulsively washing your hands hundreds of times a day. In my case, it was mostly uh, just endless, endless checking behavior. I'll give you a quick example. Um, I would check the lock at night to make sure it was locked, uh, get, go over to bed, get into bed, relax, say, is it really locked? Is it really locked? Get up, go back, check it, look at it, count to a certain number to make sure it was locked, get back into bed and repeat this behavior, not five times, not 15 times, 20 or 30 times. And the pain, Sonia, and this is so important, the pain you feel if you don't carry out the behavior is like no other pain one could possibly describe. Steve, let's go back to the first time that you are aware of having an episode. I, I just want to make sure from my own understanding, one day you went to sleep, you were basically a normal person who had no ritualistic acts. The next day you get up and all of a sudden you're into a full-blown obsessive compulsive disorder, is that correct? Well, there may have been indications in early childhood, but uh, essentially it really was that. And uh, ironically, I'm here in Chicago and the first attack happened on a highway in Chicago where uh, I thought I had hit someone on the road even though no one was on the road and I couldn't get that heinous thought out of my mind and I ruminated and ruminated and ruminated. But the good news, Sonia, is that uh, the disease is treatable. Okay, but before we get to that, just very quickly, because we all want to have some experience. There's something called self-talk. We all do it. So right. you say to yourself, but Steve, you just locked that door. You don't have to go back and lock that door again. Now, as a rational, intelligent human person, you know that that door is locked. Then yes. what happens? Well, it, it's an amazing thing about the disease. I know intellectually, in my mind, I know that door was locked. I knew I had hit no one in the car. But somehow, my, my gut, my emotional feelings what, were not sending me that same message. They were saying, it may not be locked, Steve. And if you don't lock it, how negligent could that be? You better go check it, because you don't want anybody to come into the house. And I would go over and over that in my mind time and time again. And I would constantly try to reality test it, Sonia, just as you're describing, saying, come on, Steve, you're being ridiculous. You know these are crazy, senseless acts. You know they make no sense whatsoever. But the nature of the disease is such that it, it compels you. The pain is so enormous, it compels you to check it out. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rappaport, I want to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Sometimes we call people impulsive. They're people who do things without thinking very quickly and they show that in a variety of areas in their life. Sometimes we call people obsessive and we have groups like OA for obsessive eaters. We are talking about obsessive compulsive disorders which means I think there's a thought and a deed ritualistically. But could, could you differentiate all of those things for us? Sure. Obsessive compulsive disorder is unique and there's millions of people out there right now who have kept it a secret all their life. They know they've got it. It's not the same as overeating, which can give some kind of pleasure. It's not the same as being an impulsive character who's someone who just has trouble putting the brakes on. These are people who are sane as you and I. 
You've just heard Steve, a remarkably reasonable person, describing that you have to do something. The compulsions, and some people only have compulsions, an example would be to check the locks, to wash your hands a hundred times a day. Then there are the obsessions, usually thoughts that you've done something dangerous to yourself or somebody else, or that you're contaminated with some terrible disease. But the difference in these people is they know these thoughts are crazy. They've told themselves over and over again, as have their families, why can't you just stop? But the worst part is that because they're so sane and so normal, they don't want other people to think they're crazy, so they keep it a secret. Dr. Rappaport, if we were in a psychoanalytic session and you were the patient, I might say to you, mm, yes, Judith, now tell me about your childhood. You really did want to kill your mother, didn't you? And that is why you wash your hands. It's the blood that you watch. And I'm teasing a little bit, but right. what about well, the very... I don't think you're being fair. Sigmund Freud in 1913 has a magnificent paper in which he talks about the genetic factors that by and large the very severe cases of obsessive compulsive disorder don't yield very well to traditional psychotherapy and many of my referrals and greatest sources of support have been from leading psychoanalysts around the country. That's become an older issue now. Okay, so this would not be a form of treatment. Nobody would use analysis for that. We would use what in order to treat this? There's two kinds of treatment for these right patients, and I have to really stress that this is a severe disorder. This isn't just people who balance their checkbooks or who like to come 20 minutes early to a plane, nothing like that. But for people whose lives are really disrupted by these rituals, who have the pain that Steve Strauss has just been describing to you, for people like that, there are two terrific forms of treatment that really work. One's behavior therapy, and the other's some new drugs that have been developed. And which did you use, Steve? Uh, I, I guess both, uh, to be quite honest with you. And both have been uh, phenomenally effective. Uh, the psychiatrist I worked with gave me a number of terrific tools to work with. And that, in combination with the drug therapy, uh, turned a nightmare into a normal life again. There is not a day that goes by, Sonia, that I don't think of at least two things. One, thank God the pain is no longer there. And two, how can I reach out to the millions of people out there who have this disease but are so embarrassed and humiliated by it, touch them and say, please, please go get help because help is there. Dr. Rappaport, how can there be a disorder that talking therapy can help when it may be brain linked and that is demonstrable by the fact that a drug actually will make a connection in the right. brain. More than a drug, we've shown with brain imaging studies that there's different circuits that specifically are acting, kind of short-circuited or more hot in the brains of people with OCD than other patients and other normal controls. But that's an important question. We think these are inborn behaviors, and I think that there's very little question about that anymore. But you can take an animal with an inborn behavior, and you can train them out of it. Uh, behavior therapy isn't just talking therapy. You have to go through the experience of being exposed to, let's say, dirt and then not washing your hands. That would be an example of behavior therapy for a hand washer. You could shock or, by certain sorts of conditioning, train, let's say, a bird out of building a nest. But no one argues that that nest building in a bird is an innate behavior. It's important not to get the cause, the etiology, mixed up with what helps. The drug, though, is a part of a whole list of very convincing evidence that this is something gone wrong in the brain. And then can we expect it will be familial? 25% uh, of the people we've seen in the last 15 years, and we've seen hundreds of people, have someone in their immediate family who has OCD. And that's Let's just go to another... Our that's another issue I gather of, of, right. that is combined with this. Right. Let's go to our viewers now if we may and let's offer okay. them an opportunity to talk about whether or not they have a secret that they'd like to share at this moment in terms of this disorder. What kinds of treatments they've had and whether or not it's been successful for them. 213-469-5533. about obsessive compulsive behavior our guest today our steve strasser he says that he would check his oven 40 sometimes 50 times a night or check the locks to make sure that the oven was turned off or that the door was actually locked he eventually sought psychiatric help also with us psychiatrist judith rapaport chief of the 
child psychiatric branch at the National Institute of Mental Health and author of The Boy Who Couldn't Stop Washing. Steve, before we go to our viewers, you were in treatment for nine years before you tried any of the drugs and, and found something really effective. Was there something wrong about the treatment that you were in so that we could prevent others from going through that? No, I, I don't think there was anything wrong from the treatment. It went into remission uh, for a year or two, though it kept coming back. Uh, I think the, 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 the key learning point here is that today, if someone thinks they have this disease, like I did back in 1972, and I, and I knew I had it when I got it, that they get in contact with somebody from the OCD, that's the Obsessive Compulsive Disorder Foundation in New Haven, Connecticut, and they will help that individual get in touch with a medical professional who can help them. Okay, so I, 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 don't think, I, I don't think there was anything wrong with my psychiatric intervention per se. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, uh, the psychiatrist taught me a lot of tools to help me cope with this disease. Okay, let's go to Houston now and say hello to Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Sherry, you're on the air. Um, hello. I would like to thank Dr. Rappaport for her book. I saw a um, review on the book in Psychology Today, went out and bought it last week. Um, my question is, um, I had been in a TARAP group, which stands for Territorial Apprehensiveness, and I was first misdiagnosed, I believe, as being phobic, although I knew I had obsessive compulsive, uh, compulsive disorders. Um, my question is, is this often misdiagnosed? And uh, also, if there are any support groups, uh, I'm interested in the state of Texas or more Houston more specifically as yet. Right. Two very good questions. The first is, yes, people sometimes mix this up with phobias. And one of the ways you tell the difference is someone who's phobic, let's say, oh, afraid to cross the bridge, go up in an elevator, they'd only be for disease and so on. Uh, Steve has just talked about the OCD Foundation, the addresses in the book, in my book, as well as... It will never outrun you.